obviously because uh, are you studying it? You're on air now. Right. Perfect. Lechaim, lechaim. Um, you know, this is a very, very special lesson, special shiur before Purim. So someone made sure that I will have enough lechaim that's already pre Purim just to prepare myself for Purim. Lechaim. You know that when we say lechaim, lechaim, there is two meanings. And I'm just making sure that we don't start uh, uh, early. So I, I read a beautiful explanation that we say lechaim, lechaim. Why? Number one, because the first lechaim that we read in the Torah didn't end up very well. So we say lechaim ulebrocha. The first lechaim was Noah. Noah was oh. actually planting a, a grapes and he was drinking wine. He became a shikar and didn't end up very good for him. So we say lechaim ulebrocha that to be the lechaim that you are saying will be a bracha and not the opposite. Mm -hmm. However, someone say that you say lechaim lechaim because obviously you, we want to wish each other for good life physically but also spiritually. That's why we say double lechaim. That's uh, thirty six. That's for physical and spiritual. And now we can we can start. Oh, oh, that's it. Not just me. Everyone, good. Triple lechaim. So. Uh, I was thinking, obviously, it's um, a week before Purim, but it's also a very, very special week because we start a new book in the Torah. And I was thinking to myself, obviously, we speak about Purim, but we have to start with the more frequent thing. There is a rule that our sages said, Tadir Vesheno Tadir Tadir Kodem, which means when something is frequent and something is coming once in a while, you always have to deal with the Think that they are more frequent. How we know that? Because uh, there is a very interesting discussion. I would say, you said, what do you think is the most important pasuk verse in the Torah? So some people say Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Some people said that God created the man in the image of God. But then there is a very, very strange opinion. It said that the most important pasuk in the Torah is actually the pasuk that describes the most common offering, korban, that used to be. We, did, we just start now, so everything is good. So I just told them that it's a Shabbat, it's, it's a week before Purim. So obviously we're supposed to speak about Purim, but we're also starting a new book in the Torah, which is the more, the more common thing. And I really wanted to start with the uh, shiur and the pasuk of, on something that we learned in this week's parasha, before we go to Purim. So as I mentioned, we start a new book in the Torah, Sefer Vaika. And it's very interesting, the Ramban, not the Rambam, the Maimonides, the Ramban, the Nachmanides, he writes an uh, introduction to the, the first book of Bereshit, and then also to Shemot, and he said that Bereshit, the first book of the Torah, is actually speaking about creation, creation of the world. Second book, Shmot, what we were reading till this week, is actually talking about the creation of the nation. After God created the world, He created the nation, the Jewish nation, and actually the creation uh, took few phases, you can say. First of all, He made us as a nation, took us from being slaves, and became, we became a nation by going out from Egypt. And then He gave us also a purpose. He gave us the Torah, and He showed us that He is... Uh, dwelling among, amongst us by being in Bet Amigdash. But now, the third Sefer is the most important one. Because, yes, he created the world. He, created, he told the people, okay, this is the world that I create for you. The question is, what are you supposed to do with that? How you serve God? And how you serve God, this is this week, uh, parasha, we start and the, the book of Vaikra. Is, as our sages said, this is Torah Adam, which means this is the lesson for everyone who has how to serve God. And actually, if you look at the Sukkim that the book start, the Torah said, Vaikar Moshe, God called Moses and tell him, Adam ki akriv mikem korban Hashem. Which means you want to know how to serve God, you have to know that you have to sacrifice something to Hashem. You have to give out something to God. And obviously, everyone will read, by the way, it's a very interesting, you know, I have, I'm the rabbi of the Israelis, and 
From time to time I get interesting phone calls. So one of them, just a guy that used to come to my synagogue 10 years ago, and for almost 10 or 8 years I didn't hear a word from him. Obviously COVID and all the stuff you know, changed a lot of people's life. And his life was changed in a very interesting way. I knew that, I didn't even see him for a long time, but I knew that he became spiritual. And he's involved in different groups of trying to change the world for a better place. I'm not so sure if he's doing it in the right way. Well, it doesn't matter, but at least he has the right intention. So a few weeks ago, I'm getting a phone call and I see the number, wow. The guy didn't call me for eight years. Well, what exactly he wants? She said, hi, Rabbi Dadon, I'm sure that you remember me. I said, you know, today you don't really need to remember everyone because the number is on the phone. You see the number, you see the name, you see the face, you see everything. So I said, how are you, you know? So he said to me, I really need to ask you a question because you, and you should know that your question will affect 50,000 people. Oops. I said, well, it's probably a very serious one. So what actually you want to ask? So he said to me, Rabbi, can you tell me how we can bring a sacrifice today? So I said to him, what do you mean? He said, yeah, yeah, like the sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash. I said, you know that we are not giving any, not bringing any sacrifice already for 2,000 years and there is no concept of sacrifice like today. He said, no, no, but I really need you to explain to me the book of Vaikra, the book that we start now, because I have some people that I'm in contact with and they want to serve God in certain ways, whatever they and I start to realize that, you know, it can be a bit uh, dangerous. What I'm, and I start to explain to him the spiritual meaning of the Korban. And it's interesting because when you look at the Pasuk, when the Torah speaks about the concept of Korban, which obviously in Bet HaMikdash had also physical implication, which means that was Korbanot that came from animals or from vegetables, from flour, or even, even things that water or, or wine or other things. But... The Torah said something interesting. The Torah said, God said to Moses, Adam ki akriv mikem. Someone who will want to sacrifice or to serve me from you. And I will say, just explain, especially when you see, according to Kabbalah, that the word korban in Hebrew, sacrifice, is coming from the same root as the word karov, close. And our sages said that in order to be close to someone, you have to sacrifice something. In order to come close to someone, you have to give something. It doesn't go, it doesn't go for free. You know, I know that today people in the world always think what I can get from people. But in order to get, you have to give something. So God said, if you want to come close to me, you have to give something. And what you have to give, so if you look at the Torah, there is three levels of korbanot. One is actually referring to the intellect. Change the way how you think. Don't think about just what you can get in this world, actually what is your purpose in this world. By thinking about what is your purpose, not what you can get from this world, change the, the whole way how you think, it's a way to come close to Hashem. There is another way, change your emotion, your feelings. Don't just get what you want and it just start to develop feeling toward God. And the lower level is actually action. Do certain things in order that you will come close to Hashem. So this is the simple meaning of the book that we start now, Sefer Vaikra, the way how we are supposed to serve God, that we are supposed to do certain things in order to come close to God, to connect to HaKadosh Baruch but when you look at the Pasuk, and I am not so sure how many people here talk Hebrew fluently, I know that there is actually two, now three, three people who are, are, are speaking Hebrew fluently. We look at the Pasuk, you see something strange. The Torah starts by saying, Adam ki a third person, someone who will come and sacrifice. And then it said, takrivu et korban chem, all of a sudden, and you change. First of all, from singular to plural from Yakriv, Adam, one, to Takrivu, you all bring. Second, from third person to someone that is present. And here, I have to tell you that um, every Chabad boy, when you are going to Yeshiva, you know, you're supposed to start to learn Hasidus. The first Ma'amar that you learn in Hasidut is a Ma'amar that 
האדמו"ר הזקן, the first rabbi of Chabad, wrote in the book called Likutei Torah. Everyone know Tanya, everyone know, uh, Tanya is the, the most famous book of Admur Azaken, Tanya and Shulchan Aruch, but there is also two books that not Admur Azaken wrote. It's, it's actually this course, uh, speaking of Admur Azaken, Ma'amrim of Admur Azaken, that his grandson put together in a book. The first uh, book called Torah O, which is for the book of Bereshit and Shemot, and then Vaikra Bamid Vardvarim is the book called Likutei Torah. And this is the first ma'amar that every Chabad boy, when you go to yeshiva, you start to learn. And the ma'amar actually speak about this pasuk in this week parasha, Adam ki akriv mikem korban la'asai. <coughs> and Admor Azaken said something very, very special. He said, what do you mean Adam ki akriv mikem? He said, you should know that when God decides to come close to you, sometime a person wake up in the morning and he feel that he wants to do something good today. Where this is coming from? You should know that what Admor Azaken call it in, in Aramaic word that coming from the Zohar, God decide to be nice to you. Itaarut Adelelad. God decide to wake you up today, to wake up you Neshama, and all of a sudden you feel that I want to do something good. I want to become close to God. So the question is, what do you do with that? You can say it and say, thank God. You know, not everyone. Some people wake up and they think, I don't know about the back pain. I don't know about what. But this guy, you wake up in the morning and you feel that you want to come close to God. So come at Moaz Aken and say, you feel that you, you want to come close to God? Build on this feeling. Do something in order that this feeling will not fly away. Because changes that coming from outside, which means changes that you didn't actually made, uh, uh, you didn't walk on your character in order to achieve that. All of a sudden, you wake up in the morning, you see a lot of people coming, young people, people coming to the synagogue, and all of a sudden you see that they are pouring their heart to God. You say, wow, it's amazing. You know, I saw this guy a day before Yom Kippur, and probably I'm going to see him a day after Yom Kippur, and he doesn't look very spiritual. He doesn't look that he's going to continue to be such a good person. What happened in Yom Kippur? So we all know that Yom Kippur, there is a, a spiritual revelation that our neshama feel, and all of a sudden you start to become close, you feel that you want to come close to God. So Admur Azaken said, Adam ki akriv, this word Adam, in this week parasha, actually referring to Adam ha'elion, to God Almighty. At God, once in a while, God decide to wake up certain neshamot, and all of a sudden you feel that you, you want to do something good. You should know, don't think that this will stay forever. Then straight away, this way it changed. It said, Mikem Korban Lashem. You have to make a vessel. <laughs> you have to build and capitalize on that feeling in order that will continue. Because otherwise, this feeling will evaporate. It will actually disappear after a while. And you will go back to your normal you. Unless you will actually build something under. And this is, it's actually very, very interesting to, to you know, Admor Zaken, a lot of, a lot of places in Tanya and other places, Admor Zaken actually describe and explain to us certain things that are happening to us and we are not even aware. Because some people say, you know, where is this coming from? But all of a sudden, one day I wake up and I feel that today I'm going to change my life. Today I'm going to become, I know that speaking to people like us, it's not very common, but I'm working with, with students, with kids in school. With children, you see it a lot. You know, a child look at you in the morning and you already know him. You know, the term start a month ago and you already know that he didn't really start the year very well. But he look at you and he say to you, today, what are you talking about? Today I'm going to be the best. From now on, I'm going to be the best. I don't know how long it will actually <laughs> will last, but they feel like it. And some days they wake up and they say, you know, today I will try my best. And you ask yourself, where this came from? Sometimes it came from that actually there is a revelation to his soul that all of a sudden he feels this push. And this is what Admor Azaken said, Adam ki akriv. And God Almighty decide to bring your neshama close to him. That your neshama will feel actually that the, the importance and you feel how to be close to God is good for you. And therefore you are willing to do something about it. So Admor Azaken said, if something like that happened, you should know 
do something about it. Which means, don't just think that this will stay forever. Because, as I mentioned to you before, the concept of, of itaruta de leila, which means that there is an awakening from above to our neshama, with, this actually never stays forever. The only thing that actually stays forever is something that we work on ourselves. We change certain things in, in our character. This can stay forever. Because a gift from heaven come for a while, but just go. If you capitalize and did something with that, then, then you are actually able to continue and, and change your life with that. And this, this point actually brings me to, to, to my second point, as I mentioned, the concept of, of Purim. Because, as I mentioned to you before, on Matzai Shabbat, Sunday, it's going to be the 14th day of Chodesh Adar, which is Purim. And Purim is a very, very interesting holiday. Because on one hand, how can I say it? It's the only holiday that we don't sing, we don't say Halal. You know, it's in a way, if you can uh, put the holidays like in level, it's the less Yom Tov of any Yom Tov. Which means we don't say Halal every day. Yeah, just most of the mitzvot in Purim, besides of the, reading the Megillah, are actually connected to physical things. It's very nice. We send gifts, you know, we give, we give money to the poor. We sit and eat, uh, 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 eat and drink, and the whole concept of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, mishte. You actually we supposed to 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 drink adelo yada. You know, just I think that some people try to make sure that I will I will be in this level. What actually already now, but drinking. It's not really bringing you, yes, some people think that drinking is uh, bringing you close to Hashem, but usually when people drink, uh, they are, you know, they are going out from their normality, and, and it's not. So, on one hand, Purim is the, as I mentioned, you know, the Gemara actually said, why, why we don't say Hallel in, in Purim, because even after the miracle of Purim, we were still under the ruling of Achashverosh. The Jewish people didn't really have a complete redemption. All the other holidays that we are, we are celebrating, we had a complete redemption. But in Purim, we didn't. But you read, on the other hand, this is the happiest holiday in the year. You know, a lot of people like Purim. You know why? Everyone likes Simcha, everyone likes happiness. But the happiest holiday in the whole year is, is Purim. And, and what is actually this, the story of Purim? Because... I'm sure that uh, many of you know, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we spoke about it in the in the previous year. You know, I mentioned that 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 Purim is is the less Yom Tov. So much so that in Halakha it said that technically you are allowed to walk in Purim. Like it's not like a regular Yom Tov, but also the story, the miracle that we are actually celebrating, doesn't really look like a big miracle. So it's an issue, it's a politic issue. Just at the beginning, the, the, the king was listening to his advisor and he killed his wife. And then he was listening to his wife and he killed his advisor, you know. There is, uh, people know how to, you know, you have to know how to play your cards. You can say like that. And on top of that, if you read the Megillah, one thing missing in the Megillah. Anyone know what is actually missing in the Megillah? What's the name? The name of God. Exactly. And, and it's not just, okay, you said the name of God. It's one of the 24 books of, of, of the Tanakh. And the names of God is actually missing. And as I mentioned, you can read the story and you can say that actually I can explain the whole story without the hand of God. So what actually is the story of Purim? That on one hand, you can say that less Holy Day, or less Yom Tov than all the Yom Tov. You don't find the name of Hashem. But on the other hand, it's the happiest day of the year. And it's an important holiday, so much so that the Medr said that when Mashiach will come, we will not have to celebrate all the other holidays. The only two holidays that we will have to celebrate is Hanukkah and Purim. You ask yourself why. If it's not such an important Yom Tov, and the name of God is not really revealed, so why we really, really have to celebrate this Yom Tov? So, there is two Ma'amarim of the Rabbi that's speaking about, about uh, and there is actually many, but there is uh, two ma main Ma'amarim that I want to speak about today in relation to Purim. One of them is 
הפסוק הנה מגילה. At the end of the מגילה, לצד, על כן קראו לימים האלה פורים. This is why they call these days פורים. Why they call the holiday פורים? Because על שם הפור, because of the lot. פור או פורים is lot. או איזה שאי ניבו, גורל, גורלות. What actually happened? What was the story? המן, when he realized that he had a problem with Mordechai, you know, Mordechai didn't want to show submission to, to uh, uh, Haman, so he, as it said in the Megillah, he, he knew that Mordechai came from the Jews, he said, okay, I have a problem not just with Mordechai, I have a problem with all the Jews, and we all know that he's all the descendants of Amalek, Rukhulu. So he knew that in order to fight against the Jews, he has to do something not in the norm, aside of obviously the fact to pay the 10,000 coins to Achashverosh, to give him the permission to, to kill the Jews, he also wanted to decide what is the best day to do it. So he decided, I'm not going to check and to look at the calendar and figure out what makes sense to be the best day. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a raffle. I'll do a raffle and the day that actually will fall, I know that this will be the best day. And the Midrash said that he actually do a raffle, and the day fell, the 13th day of Chodesh Adar. And when he saw that it was actually the 13th of the month of Adar, he was very happy. Why he was very happy? Because he knew that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away on Chodesh Adar. He said, oh, this is the man that the, the, the savior of the Jewish people passed away, which means that this is a man that they don't have a good luck. So I'm sure that I will be successful in this, in this month. But the Midrash said that he didn't know that in the same month that Moshe Rabbeinu died, it's the same month that he actually was born. Because you know that Moshe Rabbeinu is, was actually lived 420 years to the day. He was born on the 7th of uh, Adar, and he passed away 120 years later, exactly on the same day. Two days ago. And, and it, it was actually two days ago. But it's, it's very interesting, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was born premature, he was born six, uh, uh, six months into his mother's pregnancy. If he was actually, if he was born full cycle, was on? Anyone know? Nisan. On? No. So if Ed Adar to Nisan, to Yar, to Sivan, he was supposed to be born on Chag Shavuot, on Matan Torah, because Moshe Rabbeinu actually represented the Torah. So much so, at the end of the, of the prophet, Malachi was the last prophet, he said to the Jewish people, remember the Torah of Moshe. He said, Zichru Torah Moshe Avdi. So Moshe Rabbeinu, his essence was the Torah. He was actually supposed to be born on the day of Matan Torah. He was born three months earlier, though we know the whole story, but... So Haman didn't know that, yes, he passed away on, 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 the, on the month of Adar, but he didn't know that Mordechai actually was born on the same... Uh, sorry, Moshe was born on the, the same month of Adar, and this was actually good luck for the Jewish people. But when you read this story, and you read this Pasuk especially, you ask yourself, what is the name of every Jewish holiday? Pesach. Why we call Pesach Pesach? To commemorate the miracle. The redemption of the Jewish people happened when God passed over the houses of the Jews. Yeah? Sukkot, why we are commemorating Sukkot, God protect us with the heart, with the Sukkot. So the name represents something that connected to the miracle, to the redemption, yes, to the solution. By Purim, actually the name doesn't represent anything that to do with, with the miracle. You had to call this holiday, holiday of Esther, but Purim was actually part of the decree. The lot that Haman was doing was actually part of the decree. You give it to me? Because the day that Yud Gimel Adar was actually falling because of the lot, this was the, supposed to be a bad day. And when you think about the name, actually something that's much harder coming to, to, to mind. The Tikkunei Zohar, anyone know what's a Tikkunei Zohar? The book, the Zohar, we all know the, the, the book of Kabbalah, there is different part of, of the Zohar. The Zohar is actually written over the, the Hamishah Humshet Torah, the, the five books of Moses, but there is also extra books, that one of them called Tikkunei Zohar, the adding to the Zohar. So in Tikkunei Zohar it said 
that you should know that Yom Kippur, you know, the holy day of Yom Kippur, is so holy, but it's just Kippurim. The word Yom Kippurim, if you look at the word Kippurim, you can say Chaf every time that said Chaf at the beginning of a word in Hebrew, you can call it as K, like. So the Tugunah Zohar said that Yom Kippur, you should know, is like Purim. So Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, is just like Purim. It's not 100%. Purim, Purim is higher. Kippurim is just like Purim. And you ask yourself, really? You know, there isn't, in the Jewish calendar, there isn't any two opposite days. Yom Kippur, you know, it's a serious day. Everyone is fasting. Nobody for sure. We don't say Lechaim on Yom Kippur. <laughs> we don't, no Lechaim, no drinking, no, not a lot of Simcha, happiness. No, it's a very serious day. You know, people actually are turning, doing Teshuva. Purim, Purim is a day that you're supposed to enjoy yourself, you know. So much so that you can drink till you will not be able to figure out Ben Abu Raman and Baruch Mordechai. So what is the connection between Purim and, and, and Yom Kippurim? Anyone know? What you achieve like this, you achieve like that. Ah, so now you start to speak big, big words of Kabbalah. <laughs> the, but let's start, start you know, from the, the, the first step. What actually happened? What was the Avodah? What was the service in Yom Kippur in Bet HaMikdash? The Kohen Agadol had to do, he had to draw a lot between the two, uh, the two goats. And he had to make a lot. And one of them went, became to Korban, the other one was trying to Azazel. This is number one. And in Purim also, the whole day of, uh, the, the day of Purim actually start, we call it on the lot, on the, this Goral, number one. And also, you know how the, the day changed, that Nahafochud was actually supposed to be a bad day, but it, everything started because of this lot of Haman, yeah? drawing the, the Rafu. This is number one. Number two, what actually happened on the first Yom Kippur in, in the Jewish people as a nation? We read it just three weeks ago in the in the in the Yom, Yom Kippur. Actually, you know, if you look at the at the, at the calendar or and the sequence of event on Vav or Zayin be, be, be Sivan was Matan Torah. The Jewish people received the Torah. Actually, they heard the Ten Commandments. They didn't receive the Torah yet. Moshe went for forty days on the seventeen of Tammuz. When he came down, he realized that the Jewish people made the, the golden calf, the, the eagle. And he broke the first set of tab. And then he go back to God and ask for forgiveness. He asked, he asked that the Kadosh Baruch Hu will, first of all, he asked that the Kadosh Baruch Hu will not punish the Jewish people. Then God said to him, you actually have to make second set. <coughs> and the second set, he went again to the mountain on the first day of Elul, and 40 days end up on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is actually when the Jewish people received the second set. Of <coughs> this was the first the, the, the Yom Kippur, the first Yom Kippur that when the Jewish people received the, the second set of Luchot. And also when God said to him, Salachti I forgive, I forgive them as you said. So what is the connection to Purim? There is a Pasuk in the Megillah. That's a very interesting Pasuk because in the simple meaning of the Pasuk that Esther asked Mordechai and all the Chachmei Israel that the Jewish people will accept this, this day as a holiday. And the Megillah said that alehem, that the Jewish people accept upon themselves that these days will, this day will never disappear from the Jewish calendar and will actually celebrate this day every year and every year and in every family, in every city, in every country we will celebrate this day. But the Midrash, the Pasuk said, Kimu ve'kiblu ayudim, the Jewish people actually, uh, uh, they did it, they celebrate, and they accept upon themselves this day, that these days will never uh, disappear from the Jewish calendar, and we will always, uh, Jewish history will always remember this point. But the Midrash, take this Pasuk, Kimu ve'kiblu ayudim, actually it's a Gemara, it's not a Midrash, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat said that what is Kimu ve'kiblu ayudim? Kimu... That the Jewish people, when they received the Torah the first time in Matan Torah, they were able to say to God, you know what, yes, we received the Torah, but you force us to receive it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a really free choice. 
because the Midrash said that God said to them, you know, either you accept the Torah or the mountain will will actually uh, or will kill uh, you will be died uh, you will be dead here the, the mountain will fall over you and that's it and can't take you at home this is where, where you're going to be buried so the Jewish people were able to say to God every time and the Shem will go to heaven after 120 say what do you want from me you force us we didn't have, we never accepted however and after the Gzera of Haman when Haman said that all the Jewish people got forbid, you know, one day he will wipe out all the Chaz Shalom. For a whole year, for a whole year, the Jewish people, when Mordechai said to them that they have to do tshuva, for the whole year, the Jewish people actually follow Judaism with Mesirut Nefesh. And here they had a choice, because they had a choice to, God forbid, to convert and not be a Jew anymore, and then they will not die. But the Jewish people decide, no, we are going to stay and stick with Kadosh Baruch Hu, even if we will have to, to sacrifice our life. So the Midrash said, Kimu veKiblu Ayudim. Whatever we accept, you know, 3,400 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago was a whole year that the Jewish people show to God that now we actually accept it and, uh, and this is our choice. Because now we had a choice to... God forbid to leave it. So again, Purim is like Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur was the second tablet. The second time that uh, was a commitment between God and the Jewish people. But this was just coming from God. God gave them second ch- a second uh, chance. But on Purim, the Jewish people actually show Hashem that, yes, this is we are making a choice. We are making a choice to stick with you, even if we will have to sacrifice our life for that. And this this uh, a, a point that you see the, a connection between Yom Kippur and Purim. But you know, our sages said that Yom Kippur is a very very special day. That even according to some opinion, even someone who is not doing tshuva just the day is coming, and the day is able to atone for our sin. You know, and I'm not talking about the time of Bet Amigdash, that the Kohen used to do everything for us, but even not in the time of Bet Amigdash, Yom Kippur, according to some opinion, actually atoned for a certain sin. Why? Because there is a revelation of a, a, a certain level of, of, of revelation that actually that's above it's, uh, it's revealed the connection between Am Yisrael and HaKadosh Baruch Hu that not depends on what we are doing or what we are not doing. Because, you know, it's interesting because there is different way to describe relationship or connection. You know, there is a connection between two people that, you know, this, someone is working for you. So if he's doing the job, you pay. If he's not doing the job, you don't pay. You know, sometimes people, some, a lot of time, parents, or uh, making the mistake that their connection with their children is because the children are supposed to do what we ask them to do. And there is a lot of frustration when a parent realize, I had a whole conversation today with a father that his son is, is 11 years old. 11 years old. And it's the first time he said to me, the first time that my son said to me, I don't want to do what you, what you ask me. And it's actually he's not asking him something to do. It's asking him something to do that's good for the child. And he's really upset about it. And he said, I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with that. How is my son doesn't realize that I am his father? So therefore he supposed to follow what I'm asking him to do. You need that. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, listen, listen. So, and here's the point. So I told him, anyway, it was a, a certain situation and I said to him, I said to him first of all, he should, he should give your son a ladder to go down from this place that he, he went. Uh, he, he climbed high, too high. If you not give him a, a ladder to go down, he's just going to make it even bigger. So I said to him, just come to a compromise with him about whatever that is. Because you have to realize, and I told him, yes, it, let's, God forbid, let's say that he will not do what you, what you ask him to do. You still love him. He's not your son because he's following your instruction. He's not your employee. Okay? But 
since we, uh, it's much easier to relate to this level of, of relationship, then when all of a sudden there is, there is a, a, a setback, you all of a sudden start to ask the whole, the whole relationship. And you have to realize, yes, your son is not your employee. They, he is connected to you. And by the way, your father is also not, uh, just remember that as well. Don't take me, Chaz uh, You have to realize that there is a higher level of connection that even if he's not doing whatever you want him to do, he's still your son. So here's the point. Also in the relationship between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, yes, God brought us to this world and we're supposed to do certain things and we're actually supposed not to do this other thing. And sometimes, and as we say, we just said, you know, an hour ago in, in, in Filat Arvit, in Shema Yisrael, God said, Vayayim shamo atishmeru. If you listen to me, I will give you. Otherwise, you know, today we don't say punishment. It's not allowed to mention. We say consequences. <laughs> there is, if you do, are doing the right thing, there is, you know, let's see, if you don't do the right thing, unfortunately, there is consequences. However, there are certain day and certain special moments in life that there is a revelation to a deeper level of connection. And this is what it said in Yom Kippur. This is what happened in Yom Kippur. It said, Lifne Hashem Titaru. It's above the name of God. Which means a regular way how God relates to the world. It doesn't matter if it's a name, name uh, Hashem Elohim or Hashem Avaya. That this is a connection between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu that you are able to, to quantify and it actually you are able to... Uh, make sense of the connection. You are doing the right thing, you receive. You don't do it, you don't receive. However, there are days, there is days in, in the year, like Yom Kippur, that we say that if Hashem Titao, now there is a revelation to a much deeper connection that even the people who are not doing the right thing, Hashem still forgive them. Why? Because there is a revelation to a deeper level of, of relationship. Yeah? Now, let's come to Purim. You know, there is... A very, very interesting. Every year I'm asking myself, why is it that we are following the strict, the, you can say the, the strictest uh, 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 opinion about reading the Megillah? Because I'm not so sure about you, but I'm reading the Megillah sometimes eight, eight, nine times in, in, in every poem. Actually, this year, <laughs> probably uh, after many years, that first time I'm not going to read the Megillah here. Usually I'm I, I, obviously, I read the Megillah in the night, and then I have another place that I read it in the night, second time. In the morning, I'm reading it in my shul around 7 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning. And then I'm coming here every year. I'm coming here to, to Robert's house, and I read the Megillah around 8.15 or 8.30, but this year, they're probably going to be in Melbourne, so I'm not going to read it. But I read the Megillah. I, I actually have to read the Megillah a lot of time. And the Megillah is, is long. You know, even if you try, some people, you know, try to do it in 20, 22 minutes, but 22 minutes is really fast. To read the Megillah and actually to understand and to enjoy, to understand the story and to be able to, to take a lesson from the story, you have to read the Megillah, it's around half an hour, at least. So the Gemara said that there are, there are four opinions what actually you're supposed to uh, read from the Megillah, because it said in the Megillah, Esther told them, you know, the whole concept of sending, uh, exchanging food, it said in the Megillah, give a uh, gift to the poor, it said in the Megillah, Mishta, eating, feast, and saying, uh, it also said in the Megillah, it said also that we have to remember it, Lekayim, it called Tokif, to, we have to remember the, the strength. What do you mean the strength? You remember the story, the strength of the story, and what's actually the highlight of the story. So the Gemara said that there are four opinions. One opinion said that you have to read about the strength of Achashverosh, the king of, of, of Parasumadai. And in order to read the strength of Achashverosh, you actually have to start from the beginning. Because the first chapter of the Megillah, chapter one, is, doesn't actually talk about the Jewish people at all. Talk about Achashverosh and what he did in the, the sixth year of, of, his, of his kingdom and all stuff. doesn't actually mention anything about Judaism. The second opinion said, no, you have to actually read the strength of Mordechai. And Mordechai actually start in the second chapter. There is another opinion that you actually have to read about the strength of Haman and, and, and the whole, and then you're supposed to start to read from chapter number three. And there is the fourth opinion. 
and said, what is important for the Jewish people to remember? The miracle. You know, when God actually remembered them. <coughs> and for that, you don't have to read a lot. You actually are supposed to start in the sixth chapter. And from the sixth chapter till the end, you actually have all the highlights. The miracle, everything, and it will take you five to seven minutes. That's it. You don't have to read all, the whole half an hour. So, actually... The halacha is that we read the whole story, and you know the rabbis or the, the one who read the Megillah have to suffer, and especially if you do it five, seven, eight times. No, God forbid, Chazal Shalom. I, I never suffer. I actually enjoy reading the Megillah. But the story that I'm sure that people will realize, even if you don't understand all the words, you realize that when we come to this chapter six, Balayla in that night, the the the, the king. Were actually not able, to, wasn't able to sleep, and therefore he asked, you know, to bring the, the books of, of, of uh, the history, and then he realized the story of Mordechai. The the one who read the Megillah have to actually raise his voice when he come to this part. Why he have to raise the voice? Because here we read about the miracle. This is what it said. The Minagia Maharil, it's a book that was written around a thousand years ago. It said that when you start chapter six. The one who read the Megillah have to raise his voice because here we read about the miracle. What actually is the miracle? When you read the miracle, you can say that happened before when Esther sacrifices. She took a huge risk. She went to ask a uh, to come with Haman, and then she came to. The, but what actually happened? Balayla on the Dashnat I I know that everyone I already heard from you before that. You know, the name of God is doesn't mention in the Megillah. But it said in the Megillah, in, in the Gemara, that every time it said Hamelech in the Megillah, even though the simple meaning is, we are talking about Achashverosh, the, the, the king of, of Paras. But if you read the Megillah on a deeper level, you realize that actually Hamelech is referring to the king in heaven, to God. So what is Balai Launa the Dashnat Hamelech? In the time of Galut, the Jewish people, after the destruction of, of the first Beit HaMikdash, the Jewish people felt that God is sleeping. What do you mean God is sleeping? What's the difference between someone who is awake or someone who is sleeping? Someone who is awake and someone who is sleeping, you still have the same uh, limbs, the same, and you know what, even when you are sleeping, you have dreams, you actually have feeling, but you know, the difference is that when someone is sleeping, he is not able to, to make the difference. And, he, and, and you can think, you can dream about things that doesn't make sense. You don't see what it said the the, the, the power of choice. You don't you don't have when you when you are when you are sleeping. When you are awake, when you are conscious, then you are actually making conscious decision. You can see, you can differentiate between things. When you are sleeping, you can think about things that doesn't make sense. You can dream about things that doesn't make sense. So it said, Balayla and that night, na dedash na which means that. The, what the Jewish people were feeling till now, that God doesn't count them anymore. He doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't choose us anymore. You know, in the destruction of Beit Amidah, the Jewish people went to exile, and they didn't see a clear Ashgaha Pratid. You know, how God is, is taking care of them for a long time. And all of a sudden, in that night, was a revelation of this level of spirituality that the Nadedash Nata Melech, all of a sudden, the Ashgacha Pratit came back. And they realized, oh, now God actually is taking care of us. And it changed everything. And this is actually the miracle of poem. So coming back to what we say about in the, in the Megillah, in the, the uh, Purim and Kippurim, that it said, the Rabbi is talking, uh, talking in the Mahamar in the about different, uh, deeper levels, but the meaning behind it is that what actually happened in Purim was a revelation of this relationship between God and the Jewish people that not depends on what we are doing or what we are not doing. It's a much deeper relationship that God shows us, and this is, by the way, connected to the whole concept of drawing a lot. A raffle is between two things that seem, this, uh, you know, you're not able to choose. If you are able to choose, you don't have to make a raffle. You're making a raffle because I'm not able to choose. So when, when you reach this level that there is no difference between good and bad, and this is why, by the way, we are drinking also in, in Purim to, 
to, because we want to reach the level of lo yada, that we don't know between Ba'ur uh, 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 Aman, Baruch Mordechai. And that night was a revelation of, of this special, this level of relationship between God and the Jewish people that's above understanding. That's, you don't see the name of Hashem in the Megillah. It's above the level of Shem Havaya even. Why? And, and now when there was a revelation of that, the Jewish people were able, able to be saved. So I start the shiur with the pasuk in the parasha that it said Adam ki akrim yukem, that sometime God decided to bring us close to him. And we hope that if we have this revelation, if we have this uh, you know, inspiration, that we'll be able to, to make vessels actually to, to anchor it down to our life. So also in Purim was Balai Lahuna de Dashnat Amelech was a revelation of such a high level of, of Kedusha that actually was above the level of what we are doing or not doing. And I will say just explain how we were able to reach this level because the Jewish people for a whole year also behave in a way of Mesirut Nefesh, above understanding. They were willing to sacrifice their life even though that they knew that they can change their, their religion and they will not have Shalom have to, to, to die. But for a whole year, they didn't make any calculation of what makes sense or not makes sense. So also, and that night was a revelation from God that's above what we are doing or what we are not doing. And this is also what we read in the, in the beginning of this week, parasha, that there are moments in life that Adam Kiyakri, Adam Aileon, God Almighty, decide to bring us, to bring every one of us to give us uh, this uh, inspiration and we, f we feel that we want to be close to him. The question is how you bring Purim to day-to-day -day life. And for that, first of all, we have to say Nechaim. Nechaim, Nechaim. And I, I really want to, you know, I had, how can I say it? It's two days ago on Sunday, I'm not so sure if you know that was one of the, the, the captives, one of the, the, the girls that was taken on the 7th of October, she was here in Sydney. She, Moran, Morani and I, she came here to Sydney to speak to, I think, the UIA or JCA for a thousand women. And today she's actually in Melbourne and she's going, I think, tomorrow to Perth. And I know her and her sister and her brother-in-law her brother-in-law was a, a, an actor. He's, he's actually, he's still, till today, he's an actor. He was an Israeli, he used to work here in, in Diamonds, and also he was an actor that uh, he played in some Australian movies. And, and, uh, and it's a long story how he, he come back to, to Torah Mitzvot. He, it's actually, it's a nice story, so I, I, can, I can tell you. I, Unfortunately, his, his mother was very sick, and, and I knew him because I used to go and put film with him from time to time. And he said to me that his mother, when his mother was sick, I think it was around 10 or 11 years ago, he said to me that his mother asked him to go to Leila Seda, and he doesn't have a place to go, so he, if he can come to me. And I said to him, yeah, for sure, Dan, you can come, no problem. He came to my house. It was the second night. The first night I did it in, in the shul, and he came with his friend that wasn't a Jew or whatever that is, but he came. The second night I told him, you know, I'm doing in, in my house, you can come as well. So I said, why not? He came to, to my house and in the middle of the Lela said the second night, you know, some Israelis don't believe in second night, whatever, they have all stories about second night. So he called his mother, and he was facing, FaceTime his mother under the table. Middle of there is 40 people there, and he, I'm, I'm in the middle of reading the Haggadah or whatever there is. And he's talking to his mother to show her that he's in the middle of the Seder. But my daughter, that I think she was like eight or seven or eight, she said to me quietly, Abba, look, he's using the phone. You know, it's, it's Yom Tov, he's using the phone. And I said to her, shh, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me. You know, never know what he knows, what he doesn't know. Don't say anything. I said to her, honey, don't say anything. And that's it. And I continued the Seder. And I didn't know that he actually realized, and he saw that I told her not to say anything. And he said, later on he said that this was the moment that he decided to become four. 
that. So anyway, so after uh, long story after that, I, I, I actually flew to Israel to, to officiate the wedding. And in that wedding, I actually met uh, his wife's sister. And unfortunately, on the 7th of October, she was in Inova in the festival. And she was taken by the Hamas people. They broke her leg. And Baruch Hashem, after 60 days or something, or 50 something days, they were actually releasing her. And she was, I think, in the last group that they released. And uh, exchange, uh, so, so she came here and she wanted to see my wife and she wanted to see me. She came on Sunday night you know, to my house at like 10 o'clock at night. And you ask yourself, what exactly you can say to people who suffer so much? What exactly? And, and the, the, the most amazing thing was that she is on a mission. You know, she literally, she's still suffering. It's hard for her to walk. I asked her, you know, you saw Sydney? She said to me, I didn't manage to see not Bondi Beach, not uh, the Opera House, because, you know, every moment that I can actually, you know, speak for the people who are still in, in, in Gaza, I feel that I, I have to do it. I, this is, I'm not coming here for myself to, to, to do something for myself. No, I'm coming here, I'm, a, I'm on a mission. So I'm standing there, and, I, and, and you see that obviously people are going through and this is an experience that you know you don't wish even for our enemies. And you see something like this and you say to yourself, wow, this is so amazing. To see a person that you know, on one hand you can say for religious people, on the day of Simchat Torah, she was in, in a festival, whatever there is, selling a, a jewelry or whatever, doesn't matter. All of a sudden something happened to her and you know, some people obviously can take them to, you know, to suffer from now on for the rest of their life. But by her, it's exactly the opposite. This, you know, crazy event, all of a sudden, brought her neshama, and all of a sudden, she said to me, Rabbi, I really, I'm going soon to Israel, I really want to, to sit and speak to you and to your wife to tell you the most amazing spiritual experiences and my connection to Hashem in Gaza. How I was able to, uh, uh, you know, she was obviously, it was already 10 o'clock at night, or 10, 15 at night, and she was exhausted from the whole day in JCA. But all of a sudden you realize that something that can be the most terrible things that happen to a, to a person, but by her, all of a sudden, uh, uh, in a, the Neshama was always, all, all of a sudden the Neshama was revealed in this, in this moment, and obviously she's using it from now, now just for good things for Am Yisrael. And it's the most amazing thing. Yeah. And I, I, want, I want to say just, just <coughs> one, one thing that we all felt it right after Simchat Torah, and I feel now that you know, certain things start to fade away. The biggest issue that the Jewish people suffer, were suffering in the time of Purim was what Haman said. Haman turned to Achashverosh and said, don't worry anymore from the Jewish people. You know why? Because Yeshno Am Echad, there is one nation, they are supposed to be Echad. Yeshno Am Echad, in translation, there is nation one. Yeah, there is one nation. Mefuzar u meforad ben But don't worry about them. They are not united anymore. This is what Haman said to Achashverosh. They are scattered and they are separate among the nations. They are not together anymore. So look what Esther said to Mordechai before she started all her mission to take care of the Jewish people. The first thing she said before of doing tshuva fasting, what she said, Lech knoset kol Please go and bring all the Jews together. And then tsumu and then obviously do tshuva and fast and pray to Hashem. But the first thing she said to him, you want to fix the problem? Look what Haman was saying. The, this Amechad, they forgot to, to be one anymore. They're not any, one anymore. They forgot what this means to be united anymore. They are Mefuzah and Mefurad. Esther said to Mordechai, no, no, no. Lech Knosset Koradim. Bring them all together. Bring them all together. This is the beginning of the cure of Am Yisrael. So you see her, and I, you know, I, I was standing there, and obviously she's not, she wasn't religious before or something like that. But you see a Mesirut Nefesh of, of, of a girl that 
you know, I'm, I'm sure that she can stay in Israel and, and she's still uh, 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 injured, so the Israeli government will pay her salary and they will make sure that she will do the rehab and everything. But no, she is on a mission. You know, she was supposed to be in my shul for Shabbat, but it was too hard for her. To, so this is why she came on Sunday. But I said to her, but what do you do? Ah, 5.30 in the morning, we, are, we, have, we have a flight 6.15 to, to Melbourne, and then two days later to, to Perth, and then next week, the day after Purim, she's going back to Israel. And you see why? Because she has a mission. And I think that our mission should be from Purim. Obviously, there is what the Kadosh Baruch Hu is doing. And this is what we are praying that will be Balayla Aruna de Dash Natamela. That will actually, Hashem will reveal this relationship, this connection to Am Israel that's above what we are doing or not doing. That this is the internal and the, the special connection that we, we have with Hashem that's above the doing or not doing. This is the higher level. But what we're supposed to do is remember that Yeshua Am Echad, to be together and to make sure to take care of each other. And when we'll do our part, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do his part. Mechaim, Mechaim. Where? Where is your shul? My shul is...